So I'm a pediatric emergency doctor. I sit in an emergency department and treat kids, and that's what I've done for a lot of years, and in fact worked at the BC Children's for, uh, for a while. But nowadays at NYU, what I do is four days a week I teach. And so that I, so I, like many of you, am a teacher and have to worry about the issues and many of the issues that have been raised today. I go from talk to talk to talk and think, of, yeah, that impacts medical students and that, and, and, you know, so each of these things seems to have relevance. Well, so what I'd like to do, to, though, is to show you some of the differences in medical education. We'll talk about in general terms, in terms of what, it, what we do, but then show you one example, one task that we train people at and try and show you the complexity complexity of, uh, of what we're trying to do and maybe you can maybe it'll resonate with you in terms of what you're trying to do with you know, with kids so medicine is changing and so that uh, so in Canada in the United States wherever you are we go from you know so we used to be focused on the Marcus Welby doctor individual patient and that was completely the the center of the thing and that's still very 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 important but now we think more broadly in terms of systems in terms of population based care we used, to, we used to think just in terms of the one time you showed up in my office, you were, you were my problem. But now we think more broadly about sort of when you should be in the office, how often you should come back, and, so that, and how to interact in, in, in a continuous fashion. We used to be individuals, a solo practice, and now, we, now we're much more team-based, and, and I could regale you with the, with the size of our teams and the complexity of them. The, um, and it used to be the locus of control was mine. I was the doctor, I knew what you needed, and I would prescribe exactly what you needed. Well, now the patients come in with this stack this big of internet printouts with ideas on, on, what, to, on what they need, and, and so that I am real sort of a, now I'm off to the side and I'm the coach, and well, yeah, that one's right, but you know, sort of maybe did you think about these ones? And so. Um, used to be anecdotal. It used to be that you wanted your doctor to be gray-haired, and so that so that your doctor had collected a thousand stories that were like yours, and then would choose amongst those stories and get down to where where you were at. Now it's all evidence-based. It's research. What does the latest study research shows that sort of thing? You want that Daniel Pink? Here's a study that exactly applies to your situation. And then um, it used to be that the majority of care was in inpatient, in hospitals. That's all moved out, and only the sickest of the sick are in the hospitals now. And all sorts of things happen in the ambulatory care settings. We're trying to cope with this through technology, and so I won't go through each of these, but, but, the, but the top left there is an electronic patient record. The middle thing is a, is a sensor that you can buy for $35 on Amazon to tell you how, how badly your smoking is affecting your oxygenation. Google Glass is uh, maybe relevant to what we can do. This, um, the, there where it says 80, I can clip onto my iPhone and stick onto my chest and get an immediate electrocardiogram. That thing costs $200. And on the bottom right is the stethoscope replacement, a handheld ultrasound, so they don't have to listen to your heart anymore. I see it. Medical education has to change because of all of these changes. And so that, um, so that there's a lot of things that we, we have to think about that are different. Our learners are Cadillac learners. They come in and they have done a great job on their multiple choice tests. However, you know, sort of, uh, don't worry, your doctor is our best multiple choice test taker ever, <laughs> is not something that you want to hear, is it? So that, uh, so that we're, we, have to, we have to cant our system, and in fact, there's an identity shift that happens halfway through medical school, where you go, where you go from multiple choice test taker to, we want to change your identity to clinician. Change your identity from you are a 97.8%, I can't remember the exact number we're using, but the, um, to you matter as far as how your patient is doing. We have to think of now about, you know, sort of used to be that I was rewarded for memorizing a lot of drug dosages and facts and the like, and now they, they all sit on my, on my smartphone, and how am, I gonna, how am I going to get that to switch from sort of me memorizing things to you integrating the smartphone, and that's an educational task. And then how do I, how do I retain the person, the, the emotion of, of medicine? Imagine saying, your father has died. And so how do you teach that? And how do you guard the humanity of the whole thing in the middle of all of this technological change? 
And then finally, you know, sort of we, we think about this radiating drop in the bucket where an eye can affect you during medical school, but I have to think about the chain from me teaching you and you treating the, the patient and then the patient going on to, um, going on to in, in the whole wild of how well, a, of what can happen to a patient. And so that these ripples on the pond, how it, we're trying to captivate it, but it gets, you know, I don't really want to measure your multiple choice test score as to who you are. I want to measure your patient's compliance with their diabetes regimen and, and, and judge my education based on what's happening at the level of the patient and really what the health of the patient is. So we've got tools, and so that at NYU we discarded our old microscopes that we use for histology in favor of a virtual microscope. We've, uh, we've, uh, we've integrated a, a, a new, you know, so they went in and they digitized a, a human body and created, a, in essence, a digital cadaver. And so that, uh, so this cadaver, it's an app that you can download for ten dollars from uh, from the iTunes store, and you can you can find every single muscle, every single nerve, every single uh, every single artery, every single vein, and it's all named, it's all labeled for you. You can rotate it, you can do all of that kind of thing. And we've and and sort of as part of this, we've integrated these tools right into the cadaver lab. So we're trying to preserve the best of the traditional sorts of things and then merge in the technology so that you can right on the spot have the advantages of the virtual while you have the advantages of the, uh, of the real. So here we've arrayed our hunkiest medical students to show you our... <coughs> 3D visualizations of this thing. And so what happens is, is that app gets projected onto a screen and they don these special glasses so they can see it in 3D and so they can get a real sense of the three-dimensionality three of anatomy and really refine their mental models and explore in a way that we never could before. And then, um, and then the other te technique that we brought in is simulation in that, uh, in that we're, we're sort of learning from the airline industry and trying to recreate those scenarios that only happen every once in a while. But when they do happen, they're extremely, extremely important. So the person who collapses and is about to die and you have four minutes to resuscitate them, in this team-based sort of thing, 13 people descend on that person in order to try to save their lives. And so those 13 people would be the, are never the same 13 people, and yet they have to come together, which each having their own proper role and each being mission-focused while the whole thing runs. And so that we practice that over and over over and over again on mannequins, that mannequin costs $100,000. And, and the reason it costs $100,000 is it allows us to recreate these situations in a way that's safe and, and effective. So I'd like to, this is an audience participation part of this talk, okay? So, so I'm working in the BC Children's and in comes a 10-month-old child with fever and has had a cough for three days. And so then we take the story and then the resident orders a chest x-ray and this is the chest x-ray you see. What do you see? Okay. The left lung doesn't look so good. Hey. <laughs> okay. Good. So, so I'm ten months old. I'm working in the BC Children's. It's flu season. There's there's fever and cough everywhere. They're hanging off the off the rafters. They're in the waiting room. The waiting room's three hours. Everybody's mad and you know sort of uh, sort of coping. I'm just sort of trying to trying to do my bit. And so we get this this X-ray. And so when I go to look at the X-ray, and when the resident came back and said, I think there's a, there's maybe a left-sided pneumonia. And so that if you, if you look back in here, it's sort of um, in, in behind the heart, there's a pneumonia looks white, and so that this white stuff, you know, sort of could be pneumonia, and people would argue about whether or not this is a pneumonia here. So that, you know, and you don't want to hear this, but, you know, sort of a eight out of ten radiologists would say that is a pneumonia, and two out of ten would say it isn't, and, you know, so there's a bit of variability to that. <laughs> But as, as we heard from the front row, look at this rib, okay? So this rib's horizontal, this is the back of the rib. This rib's horizontal, this rib's horizontal, on this side is horizontal, 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 these are all straight. But this one's canted off at an angle, right? Right in here. 
That's different. So, so, so part of the task is, is like go into it with this mindset, this is pneumonia. And when in fact, it's, um, it's, uh, I have to pay attention to something that's complete, that, that I don't necessarily wouldn't focus on it with my mind's eye. The problem for me is, is that this is exactly where ribs fracture when you, when you have child abuse. And so there's somebody who gets shaken like this, the rib fractures in exactly that spot. And so that as a physician now, I'm faced with a dilemma. Okay? So, that is, so that as teachers, you're mandated reporters of child abuse, and so you recognize this, this, this dilemma. But you know, sort of if it's really a fracture, then you know, sort of, a, sort of then I'm up in this quadrant. I say there's a fracture, there is a fracture, and, and we're good, right? And so that, uh, but, um, but if I say that's not a fracture, and it is one, I've missed child abuse. Whereas if I say there's no fracture, well, if, if that isn't a fracture, and I said it was a fracture, then I've created a situation. And what I have in front of me is a lovely family, so, that I, so it doesn't look like there would be any issues or anything along those lines. Okay. So to rather just quickly tell you the story, the person, we ended up activating the whole machinery. After a couple of days, interviews and the whole bit, it was all fine. And so that everybody concluded that this was just the way this kid was built. But you can see the complexities and you can see it's sort of, a, sort of what, the, what the issues can be like. And so, so, so what we've done in the meantime is we've sort of gone on. I'd like to use that example to show you how, how we train people in terms of deliberately practicing this skill of reading x-rays. So, that, um, so here's, a, here's, a, here's a thing that we've created in which it's one of those you make the call things. And so we show you an ankle x-ray and then the person considers this ankle x-ray and then has to declare it either normal or abnormal, sort of up here. And we put these qualifiers on probably indefinitely. And again, you don't want to hear that the doctor says probably a fracture, you know, sort of thing. But, um, but, uh, but we, they do this and then they get immediate feedback. Okay, you were right, you were wrong. Did you put the yellow dot in where the fracture is or did you, did you miss it? And so, that, uh, so it gives you feedback and, and in bad educational theory manner, when they get it wrong, they get this big red X and it's red and it says incorrect. And so, so, that, um, so we get people to practice one case, two case, 200 cases over and over again. And we can generate for each person, you know, sort of across the number of cases that they do, a learning curve where there's this index of goodness that says, you know, sort of initially you're not all that great, but gradually your learning curve comes up here and you get better and better. It won't surprise you to see that there's a lot of, even amongst our Cadillac medical students, a lot of variability. And so that some of the people come into this pretty good, and some come in not very good. And, but, you know, so by and large, the majority of them learn in this paradigm. And so when you average this all out, you get a nice sort of a thirst and learning curve. But if you put everybody's learning curve on here, you can see that some people just don't have an aptitude for this, where some people are outstanding. And so what we've done or accomplished is instead, you know, so we started off really, really wide and we've decreased the variance so that we clearly people are learning and we're doing our job of, of, uh, of moving the whole average up. But even there at the end, after 234 of these repetitions, there's still quite a bit of variability. And so what we're trying to do in medicine is accommodate this kind of variability. And so that it's to acknowledge that the paths of even, even the most standardized group of individuals will be variable and, and to acknowledge the complexity of the context and, um, and still move people through. And so, that, um, so all of medicine is axed on now on this competency movement. This isn't new to a group of educators, but we're trying to move away from knows, those multiple choice questions, to knows how it shows how and can actually do. And, then, and to use my learning curve example, what, what we used to do was that with these two people, we would, we would assign, go out there and do 150 of these ankle x-rays. But after having finished 150, you can see we would graduate people with different competency levels. And so, there, so there's this tremendous effort right now across all medical schools in North America to get off of that, this time-based, assignment-based type of thing, and instead to say, to assign a competency level like me with a pointer, right? so, so, that, uh, so, that, uh, so that you have to attain this competency level, which we will have determined is the safe 
an appropriate competency level for our patients. And in fact, in determining these competency standards, we invite patients to sit on those competency committees and say, yeah, that's about right in terms of, uh, in terms of that kind of thing. And so, that, so here I've shown you, I've shown you two people, you know, so this is that one from before, already not bad at this, had probably had some radiology training before, and now has sort of gotten better and better and better as they go along. Whereas this person hadn't had very much radiology training at all, and so rapidly sort of learns the easy stuff, but then sort of clearly has to work at it and is dancing around this competency line. What we're trying to do is show people these things. So to the extent that we can, give them a cockpit, give them a whole sort of information dashboard about their learning so they can say, yeah, this is where I am right now. And to model, you have to do 200 more of these or whatever it is, and you're really getting it. Okay. So it's a single example, you know, this is ankle radiographs, there's a lot more to being a doctor than being a good ankle radiographologist, but you can see the idea and you can see the, you know, sort of a metacognitive aspect of teaching people about learning so that they can, um, so that they can sort of carry that to whatever aspect of being a doctor it is. And so that, um, so that in using these new technologies, we're trying to sort of take the specialness of these medical students and yet at the same time get them to be adaptive learners. And so, that, um, so what I'd like to leave you with is this graph. And so, that, uh, so this is from, uh, from Dreyfus and Dreyfus. And again, it's a learning curve, but it's a learning curve kind of for, across the, the, whole, the whole of the enterprise. And you start off at a novice and you don't know very much, but you gradually move up to being competent and perhaps proficient. But, you know, sort of we used to, you know, when, when people learn how to drive, they become automatic and they don't learn anymore and they stay at this level forever. What we want from our doctors are to get up here but to keep on going. And so that if I can teach them during the time that they're becoming competent how to learn, and so our hope is, is that they'll carry that forward out into 2030, you know, so when, when we no longer have them, but at the same time that they can adapt and, and get better and better and better, so that, uh, so that at age 64 and a half, just before they're going, going to retire, it's not a hanging on by the, by the edges of their fingernails in terms of confidence, but instead they're, getting, they're going out in a blaze of glory in terms of getting better and better at this thing. Thank you very much.